Hi and welcome. My name is Stuart Gregg. I'm the Industry Innovation Director here at Exora. Welcome to the webinar. So this webinar we're going to have a debate with, uh, with an esteemed panel and we're going to look at the drive to net zero and in particular has the oil and gas industry got what it takes. Before going into the debates I'd like to talk about the trilemma that's currently facing the oil and gas industry for the first time in its history I fair to, it's fair to say. The first one's COVID-19. COVID-19 has caused demand to crash because everybody's had to change their lives to cope with the pandemic. And I guess one of the questions that I would like to explore today is, does the pandemic, has it forced change that is going to be indefinite? We're already seeing people moving into the countryside. We're already seeing people using less traffic and not flying as much. Will that continue as we get used to using uh, video conferencing? That leads to the oil price. The oil price, because the demand has crashed, has naturally followed suit. However, prior to COVID-19, the oil price was already tumbling down because of the different geopolitical activities that were taking place in the world and that also moves on to the next part of the trilemma and that's renewables for the first time in its history oil and gas has got a real challenge out on its hands the cost of renewables is tumbling the efficiency of renewables is, is rising and with cop 26 coming in next year there's already changes to the way that we'll be living come 2030 and 2035 which again applies more pressure to the hydrocarbon industry I'm really pleased to say I've got an esteemed panel here today, but they can actually introduce themselves far better than what I can. So I'll go first to Clara. Hi. My name's, am I on? <laughs> Sorry, my name's Clara Altabell. Um, I'm VP ESG for Serica Energy. Serica is an independent oil and gas. Oh, here I am. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I'm Clara Altabell. I'm uh, VP ESG and business innovation for Serica Energy. We're a, an independent, aim-listed oil and gas upstream company. Um, we have assets in the UK, Northern North Sea. We produce around 25,000 BOE a day, which is primarily gas. Um, I'm a petroleum engineer by background. And like I said, now I'm responsible for environment, social governance and business innovation. That's great. Thank you, Clara. Chris. Good afternoon from a rather dreek Aberdeen. Um, my name is Chris Ayres and I'm the Chief Customer Officer here at OPEX Group. Uh, OPEX Group is a leading uh, data analytics and predictive technology company. Our solutions help oil, gas and energy customers make better use of their data so that they can achieve cleaner, more efficient and lower cost energy production. So hopefully really getting after those uh, trilemma of challenges that face the uh, energy industry. And although we're small, um, we like to think we pack quite a a considerable punch. That's great. Thank you, Chris. And last but not least, Ian. Stuart, thanks for having me. Uh, so I'm the founder of the Energy Council. We are a members-led body for financiers, um, investors, as well as senior executives across the whole energy space. So that includes renewables as well as hydrocarbons. And our core focus is on sustainable deal flow. So we will look traditionally, agnostically, whether that be uh, hydrocarbons or renewables, and we'll do that anywhere in the world. That's brilliant. So we've got a real mix on the panel today. You've got global perspective, got UKCS perspective from an operator perspective and we also got somebody who's involved in, in digital technology as a supplier to the industry as well so I really like the different angles that we're going to get today. It's fair to say uh, in my opinion personally oil and gas is at a crossroads. We see almost daily we see some sort of report that's coming out about the demise of hydrocarbons. Just yesterday there was a report about high renewables is going to be 50% 50, 50 cheaper to actually adopt in the future than it is currently today. This is real pressure in the oil and gas industry. And does the oil and gas industry change its behaviour moving forward to match into that energy transition? Or, oh, Clara, I'd like to ask you probably the first question. What I've seen in my time in the oil and gas industry, which is very cyclic, which I'm sure we're all aware of, is when the oil price changes, either up or down, the behaviour of the industry changes as well. Now, there's a lot of predictions that mid-2021, when vaccination programmes kick into place, therapeutics kick into place, that the demand starts to come back for hydrocarbons. There's also a capex throttle that has been held back for a number of years now, post 2014-15. So there's going to be potentially a supply crunch in the future, which means the demand's going to go up, supply's going to go down, which we all know from an economic perspective normally means the oil price starts to rise. Is that the moment where oil and gas operators, is your perspective, go, OK, energy transition, let's take our foot off the gas, metaphorically speaking, and let's get back to what we always did, business as usual? No. <laughs> so, um, so if if demand increases um, and there's 
a, a squeeze in supply, it means that the, the energy transition hasn't progressed enough so that renewables may be coming down in price, but they, they haven't had the time to really establish and provide the energy that, that people are demanding. And so oil and gas has to plug that gap. And I think government legislation, the commitment to the, the Paris Agreement will dictate that oil companies have to um, adhere to the transition, have to work in the environment they are to, um, to have a social license to operate. And if prices go up, it gives companies um, the leeway and the profit margins to actually do that, to get to net zero, to implement digitalization projects that reduce emissions, increase efficiencies. Um, they can even pay for, for offsetting if the, if the um, profits are there. And so I think higher prices could mean the opposite. It could mean that the oil and gas companies can do more to get to net zero, to produce as a net zero and to develop, develop stranded assets that otherwise wouldn't be developed. Because if you have an asset and you need to electrify it from shore, you need to offset all the emissions from the supply vessels, the drilling, that that doesn't come cheap, despite what the government is saying that the transition is not going to cost us anything. I, I think it is. And you need an oil price that will justify the financial investment decisions required for those projects. So conversely, if prices come down, what you'll see is um, older platforms, mature assets will um, cease production early and new developments won't occur. And then countries like the UK will have a shortage of domestic supply um, of energy. It won't be able to keep up in the short term with renewables and it will rely on imports. And those imports might be from areas that haven't signed up to the Paris Agreement, aren't as worried about net zero. And so it's almost you know you're worse off than if the prices were higher and you could actually extend the life of the uk assets and develop in a responsible net zero way okay so so i hear two things playing out there you you don't believe that when we took return to oil price that's should we say more preferable than it is today that that profit won't go to the shareholders from a tsr perspective dividends won't rise you you see that that monies would be used to help take forward the, the energy transition from such as projects that like you say, like electrification in the UKCS? There'll be, I'm not saying we won't give a dividend to shareholders if the profits rise, that you know, you can do both. You oh, can you reward your shareholders okay. for, for backing you and you can invest in net zero in your future as a, a company. Um, you can do both and it's easier to do both if you have um, enough profit that you're not making a loss. If you're making a loss, you can't do either. Okay. So it's not an either or, it's just you're having that margin to be able to do both. So that's a UKCS perspective, I guess, predominantly. So what about from a global perspective? How do you see that playing out? Say in Africa, when the oil price starts to double to what it is today, how do you see that playing out in Africa? Um, somewhat differently. Uh, I think if you, I think the UKCS and the operators in Europe in general and parts of the world have a potentially um, a different compass, if you will. So they're, uh, you know, primarily when you go on the ground and you speak to these individuals, whether it be privately owned or whether it be also aim listed African explorers and producers, um, there is a general sense that they want to get back to normal. Now, what normal means in 2020, who knows? Uh, and I think there is, that's where there's going to be somewhat of a conflict. And, you know, just to go and lend myself a little bit to Clara's point, that there is a danger that we simply move the barrels of oil, the, you know, which are net, not net zero, to a different part of the world and we become a net importer of those, whether that be for feedstock, it doesn't have to be just pure play production. And so uh, what we see as a member's body is a very different approach in general. There are, of course, examples which sit outside of this where you've got explorers who really just want to get back to what they've done for the last 20, 30, 40 years. And, um, there is a, I know we would probably lend ourselves to this in the discussion somewhat down the line, but there is a question mark whether, you know, we need to look at that as well from, a, from the S and the G and the ESG perspective in terms of job employment and, and local education and, um, and I guess the development of those economies. So not completely the same slate, though, um, though I do recognise there are companies in Africa that are absolutely looking to 
you know, move to being just beyond just being pure hydrocarbon players. Yeah, it's an interesting point because if you look at the Brexit talks now, what I hear a lot in the media is a level playing field. So, so moving forward, you could apply that to, to where we are as an industry, right? So if the oil price does increase and we have got the ASG agenda placed upon it, the UK continental shelf as an example, how do we ensure that level playing field for other parts of the world is the balance that, that oil and gas companies have to play? I, I absolutely agree Correct. with that. And I think potentially one of the, 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 the key levers in that has got to be technology. It absolutely has got to be technology. And I'm interested in, in, in where you are, Chris, in if you see the oil price start to increase, what impact that would have on your business and, and how you could help operators to, to be part of that level playing field? Well, I guess I'm going to be a little bit controversial. I think a little bit of um, pressure, and I've been part of this industry and, and, and living up in the northeast of Scotland, so I've, I've felt acutely um, the pressure over the last uh, five years and, and cycles before that as well. So um, I, I am speaking very much with that in mind, but I do think a little bit of continuous pressure um, helps to change people's perspectives and, and, and to change ultimately people's behaviours. And, and, and that's, uh, you know, that, that cultural and behavioural shift is really um, it is, has started uh, in the oil and gas industry, but, but um, uh, we're going to need to keep working at it. Um, I think technology uh, plays a really, really um, important role um, and, and will continue to play a really important role. And what's really interesting is it's such a broad church that, um, you know, that, that, that ranges from the sort of the, I'll, I'll call it the big hard uh, net zero tech like, you know, CCS and, 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 and hydrogen, uh, hydrogen and, and floating offshore wind, that sort of thing through, you know, um, to, to the more sort of uh, digital uh, technologies um, that, that we're working on and working with, uh, with our customers uh, to help, you know, deliver tangible benefits sort of with immediate effect. Um, so I think it can have a real uh, uh, influence. And I think even some of the challenges we've just talked about today about importing um, a, uh, not just hydrocarbons, but the um, dirty hydrocarbons or dirtier hydrocarbons, you know, there's technology that, that, that we, you know, that's already in existence that can sort of map the the um, the uh, I guess the environmental impact of, of producing those hydrocarbons and sort of um, deliver those in a way using technologies like blockchain that actually allow um, uh, those that are actually taking the hydrocarbons to, to understand completely the footprint. So what's interesting is that technology can help to solve some of the challenges that we've raised, you know, just in the last sort of three three minutes. Now that, that's really interesting, Chris. So if if I come back to today. So the oil price is what it is today, yeah? And, and, no, and if I had a glass ball and I could work it out, then I'd, I'd be pretty rich, right? And I wouldn't be sitting here now. So Clara, I'll come to you with the next question. So if, if we, in the current world as it is today, hopefully moving forward into 2021, what do you see as the major challenges that are slowing down the sector on the journey towards net zero? Um, I think the main challenge slowing um, companies down on the net zero journey is um, clear legislation and if we're, yeah, if we're looking outside digital um, like Chris said that the major major technologies are CCS hydrogen um, and we've been there in the past there's been these CCS pilot schemes they've got so far um, oil companies have put in hundreds of millions into the concept and then the government pulled the funding and they didn't continue so now there is a push um, to go to clusters and there's been money. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm talking about the UK here, but I think the story's um, similar throughout Europe at least, that in the future oil and gas to be net zero, you need CCS, you need the hydrogen and you need to, to join up with the industrial clusters. But we, we don't yet know where they'll be. There's funding out there, but not enough to fund all these clusters. I think there's 10 or eight or ten in the UK and there's funding for about two and none of them have been kicked off and I think that's the main drawback it's we're just starting out there oil the majors are getting in and some of the larger independents are getting into these clusters and looking at licenses for CCS injection but it's it's quite slow and quite everyone's a bit nervous about investing huge amounts because you don't know which ones are going to take it take off because yeah, the, the government's giving some investment, but not enough, and they're expecting the, the, the private sector to come up with the rest, and it's still a bit unclear in my mind. So I think that's what's holding us back. Okay. So we're still at that sort of pilot stage in the sort of in the 
in that the joining up the dots and how you make oil and gas net zero in the transition period until the renewables catch up and take over. Okay, so if I play devil's advocate as a, a public cons customer, should the, should the government assist oil and gas to, to get to that energy transition point? If, I, I guess one of the projects that I'm well, well aware of is the, the CCSU one for St. Uh, Peterhead, Peterhead Power Station. I remember at the time that the funding was pulled from that and, and within, within hours there were statements from a, a number of oil companies to say that they were no longer involved in that project. I think if I, look at, if I go back to the top of this, of this discussion, the trilemma is happening, it's there, it's out there and it, it's really forcing oil and gas to think differently. If the government wasn't to commit funds as much as what it would have done in the past, does that stop oil and gas companies moving forward or, or do you think they've got a bigger part to play? I think it would stop them moving forward because I think it's we need the CCS and the hydrogen not just for oil and gas. You need it for the whole. You need it to decarbonise industry, decarbonise the steel industry, the the building industry, um, chemical industry. It's not just oil and gas production. You know, all the power stations. You need, it's a joint up effort, so no one industry can take full responsibility. And at the moment, it's it's just not profitable it's just a huge cost so i think it needs government intervention clear legislation and yeah a clear economic business model going forward where do you see that ian so what i'm hearing there and i hear legislation i think that's absolute that's got to happen there is some levels of, it, of legislation and it's developing we're, we're quickly moving into phase four viewers in europe itself you just see what the impact of that is post Brexit, of course. But with your members, do, what, what, what's the mood music within your members for the energy transition and the part that government plays? Yeah, and, and again, just to give a kind of a broad answer, it's, it, it differs wherever, you, you know, specific to government, it differs wherever you are in the world. So if you, do, if you just take Western Europe uh, as, as kind of a catch, you've got 38 banks that have signed up to the UN uh, net zero climate change accord. So effectively saying we will no longer intentionally um, commit to um, emissions, or, um, type 1 emissions, um, and by extension type 2 and eventually type 3. Um, I mean, again, our members make, are, are generally financiers and banks, so you know, if you look at banks, I think we've got 65 banks now globally have said they won't invest in coal. And so there is a, you know, the push-pull of government. I, 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 my view is the private sector is always going to, and this is really the case with technology, that you can't legislate technology. And I think that actually the sector piece is almost getting ahead of, the te of government at times. So you see that with tariffs, where, you know, feed-in tariffs now, as one example, where well-intentioned and they've served their purpose, which is yeah. a good indication of government intervention. But ultimately, the way that the structure of those deals are now, where it's a PPA, um, it's almost getting ahead of the, you know, the legislation. That's not just a UK thing. That we're seeing that globally. Um, you see that in the United States, where the the T and D infrastructure is a good example of that, where actually they're already creating solutions way before the at a state level. So um, my answer is, is always, I think government is there to induce, but I think you know, the private sector has got a really good track record, oil and gas sector, of getting almost ahead of that at times. Uh, I think that's the positive thing as we go into what the next 10, 15 years looks like. Um, and then linked to that, of course, you've got, we talk a lot about needing the funding. Well, that comes from the investors and the financiers. That, and like I say, we've nearly got 40 of those signed up to, committed to net zero. And, and I think a really interesting debate isn't necessarily renewables versus oil and gas. I, I do think there's a, a debate between renewables and oil and gas versus coal. And I think that's a really interesting one. And uh, I like a stat, so I'll put this out there. Since 2011, the US has reduced its emissions by 40%. You know, might not be a popular fact, but it's a fact. Um, that's from the move from coal. That's not from a move directly into renewables. And I think that's an interesting question about our tolerance as industry and as society for gas to, not, uh, to play a, a big role in that transition. I think, well, I think it's an interesting point. I like that stuff, by the way. I think as the bar starts to get tighter and tighter and higher and higher, do, do we then, is that when the question, because I think what you've seen is the natural evolution from let's drive down coal's usage, then it's going to be down oil's usage, then it's going to be gas's usage, and by then everybody's hoping we'll have a full electrified system and we're in renewable mode, I guess, in typical when you read the media. The point I like to pick up, though, which is really interesting that you said, is government's got a part to play, 
but the industry needs to lead the dance is, is my interpretation yep. of what you said. And, and I, I think most people are in that position as well. One of the things that I see in our sector that I don't see in other sectors is we still seem to manage technology as a project. And I think that comes, and I've discussed it on other panels recently as well, it comes from our history of being engineers. And it comes from being a very risk adverse because it's a hazardous industry. Whereas if you look at other industries, they, they view it as agile sprints, products, fast failure, move to the next thing, develop it, that works, let's deploy it. Do you see that happening within our industry? Um, not at scale. Um, so prior to the oil and gas industry, I was working in the telecoms industry. So it's, it, it's, a, good, it's a good reference point for this question. And I, I think there's a higher tolerance. And I think, you know, probably Chris can probably speak to this probably more than I can. But there's certainly a higher tolerance towards failing fast. Now, clearly, there's a health and safety issue, which oil and gas, unlike other in industries, has to be very mindful of. Absolutely. Um, but if you know, you compare to something like in France, the, the Orange Labs, which is where a lot of the telecom, um, France Telecom as it was, where a lot of their innovation. Well, that's a model that's been copied quite openly by Total as one example. So um, I think there's room for improvement yeah. and it's whether we are game for it, I guess. And you know, probably yourself and Chris and Clara have got some probably more, more, more skillful views on that than me. And I think the, point, the other point to that is not only are we game for it, is are we going to be forced to do it? Because if we're not game for it, we're out the game, technically. Absolutely. Yeah. Chris, what's your opinion on that in, in regards, do you, see, do you see industry or your customers willing to fail fast in a safe environment? Or do you still see that, that really stringent project management, prove what you can deliver for me, prove the benefit of my business approach? Yeah, I think so. You know, there are pockets um, where we see that sort of modern agile sprint um, culture and, and behavior deployed and, and, and working well. Um, it, it is a complete mindset shift from um, the sort of uh, cultural legacy that we have deploying major projects um, in, in the oil and gas business. And, and unfortunately, that, that sort of starts at the very top. You know, that, that culture of deploying large projects means that you go about looking for a business case and, and, and looking to sort of, you know, start at the very, very top rather than look for some and, and some sort of overwhelming um, change delivered through one big vehicle, which invariably um, it, uh, becomes a white elephant. You know, I, I think it was listening to Mark Priestley, who used to work for McLaren F1, who, who talked about, you know, this is an industry that, that seems to be constantly um, bringing new, exciting innovation, but actually their mindset is, is very much just every single day do something different to improve uh, using the technology, using new technology to improve um, the, the current production and the current operations working very much in that agile way. And I think that mindset shift um, uh, is we're seeing pockets of it. And I think, you know, as the, the biggest challenge I think the industry faces is that cultural shift. And it is about, you know, bringing in, um, you know, new young uh, engineers with, with, with a new broad mindset who are used to working in this, in this new agile way, um, are used to working in a very digital context. Um, and helping to support and, and, and reinforce some of the, the directional shifts that, that are being uh, spoken about, I think, at senior level. I think, you know, the, the reality is that digital technology can be deployed very, very quickly, and it can help to start to change the behavior. So it's one of these things where you almost have to go um, and, and, and use the, the, the implementation to, to start to change people's behaviors. But it is, you know, and there is a little bit of risk there, not sort of traditional oil and gas project execution risk, but, you know, risk that it, it might not work 100 percent, you know, the first time that you do it. But actually, you know, it does start to, you know, the intangible benefits of doing this can can sort of start to take hold, change mindsets, change culture. And then you start to pick up speed um, and, and really start to see those 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 meaningful business results that, that, at the other end. That's interesting, Chris. And Clara, I, I'm really interested in your opinion on this. It's just something I want to state as well. For, so for me, somebody involved in the industry for a long time, we are super innovative. Yeah, you're talking about people who go and drill in the middle of the ocean, miles deep, and, and extract a hydrocarbon 99% of the time safely, produce it, get it, to the, get it to market really quick. So I hear this a lot about oil and gas isn't innovative. I don't think it's not innovative. I think it comes to what you touched on, Chris, which is culture. And that culture to get somewhere quick and understand that you can fail. And I'm interested, Clara, in your opinion, because you're heading up the innovation drive at Serica, how do you approach this? How do you get your, your, your teams to, to think fast, deliver fast, and fail fast in a safe manner? Is that something that you're really working on? 
Yeah, so our, our journey, we're, we're relatively young in this space. So um, we we acquired our Nordsea asset in um, two years ago, at the end of 2018. And before that, we were non-operated um, production. We didn't have a facility. And so we, we acquired the facility from BP. And so it was a huge step up for us, you know, going from, you know, a dozen people to 150 people and all the IT and digital technology associated with that. So our initial first year was don't break anything, <laughs> keep production going, um, let's see what we've got. And we did simplify quite dramatically. So from, from when we got the systems, um, we managed to, to simplify sort of nine IT systems down into one just by taking a fresh look at it and embedding that. Um, so I'd say the first year was just optimizing the systems we had. It was focused. We've got a very mature asset. The, the platform's been in the middle of the ocean since 1996. Our main priorities are ensuring its integrity. So inspecting, repairing, keeping on top of that. But that's our number one safety critical operational priority. So, so I will say our first year was just ensuring that happened. In the second year, we start looking more at, at um, digitalization and it's really getting a handle on our data. Because when you do these transactions, the the, the sellers, their, their high priority is not to give you the data in the, in the, the best possible manner. It's to just fulfill their obligation and, and hand it over. And every single operator, I think, has the same issue with data. You know, it's a mess, it's in different formats. It's, you have different, different uses for the same data in different ways. Your vendors might have a different different drawings to what's in your library. And and so we've been concentrating on cleaning up the data, making it accessible, and then using, you know, we use Power BI, but using tools to, to help visualize and improve. And we're, we've seen results and we are um, doing better and we've got some you know, as as you succeed, you get believers and people support it, and then they're they're more likely to to want to do more. Because um, yeah, we've been using spreadsheets for 10, 20 years. People are wedded to them. That's what they understand. So, get moving them away from that and saying there's there's more they can do. Yeah, it is a process, um, and we're getting there. But would I say we're agile? No. Would I say we're happy to fast fail? I'd say no. We're still in in that. You know, this is the project, get it approved, get it clearly defined. Um, yeah, we'll slot it in here. Don't we've only got limited resources, you know, don't don't overwork our engineers. <laughs> so uh, so we're still still limited by that. So um I think that we're not the worst and we're getting there and as more people start seeing what digitalization can do and how it can make their life easier and just putting a bit of time in up front helping to clean up the data, helping to design reports, um, visualization software, et cetera, will benefit them in the long run. So it's that short-term pain. And if it goes wrong, not to just say, well, I told you so, I told you it was a waste of money, to sort of try again and, and build on that. So yes, as an industry, I think we're, we're a bit of a lagger compared to other industries, which are more digital focused. Maybe they have more customers, maybe they're more front facing. Um, but we're getting there. But I do also think getting the right talent is going to be difficult because we haven't got the best reputation, we haven't got the best image, and so all the the talented whiz bang geniuses want to get into renewables. And so we need to keep attracting them and saying, look, you know, you're using our energy. The the demand is going to be there for 20 years. Help us get it as clean as possible and help us get it to net zero while the transition is happening. Okay, thank you. There's a, there's a few things I want to pick up on, and I'll, I'll come to Chris next as well. So the first thing I want to pick on is around your digitalization journey. So I recently read a report by Boston Consultant Group, who did a survey globally in different sectors, not just oil and gas sector, and they found that on average, only 30% of digitalization programs are a success. And there's a number of reasons why that happens, and two of the reasons you actually mentioned. And the first reason is you don't have a dedicated team. And because you don't have a dedicated team, it becomes part of somebody else's job. And because it's part of somebody else's job, they're too busy focused on what their main job is, so they don't deliver. And then don't deliver, 
everybody said it was a waste of time in any way. And then that comes onto the second point as well. And people start to see digitalization as more of a ball and chain rather than something that can enable their business to move forward. So Chris, from your perspective, first of all, I'm pretty certain you just don't throw data over the fence, right? No, yeah. absolutely not. I think, um, you know, uh, the, the, the most important thing, I think, with all of this is, is to make sure that you're actually bringing some value that's, that's measured in old money, um, you know, within, within the, the oil and gas industry, right? So, I mean, we have some um, very clever, those, those tech savvy whiz kids that, um, that Clara just mentioned, we've got quite a few of those working in our organization, but they're paired up with oil and gas industry experts because, you know, technology for technology's sake is, is one end of the spectrum. And I'm sure there's plenty of people doing some really amazing stuff in, in that space, but actually to, 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 to get those believers to, to, to start to deliver real value you know, you need to be able to to keep a foot in 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 the more tangible, um, and 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 only that way uh, can you start to sort of move people across the bridge towards you know being fully embracing of, of the new technologies. So I think having a real focus and and some flexibility as well in your deployment approach um, to uh, to adapt to a, a customer's specific requirements and where they sit on that that you know digitalization journey. Um, is really, really important. So, you know, there, there may be some, you know, more advanced uh, oil and gas operators in, in this space. And you mentioned Total and they, they've, they've invested heavily. I know, you know, you can look at Aka BP as well, these sort of flagship oil and gas companies who pride themselves on, on, on this kind of, deploying this kind of technology. Um, and, and, and they might be looking for very specific, you know, data science applications that, that you know, um, that can slot into you know their their uh, infrastructure, but equally you've got you know the much smaller operators in 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 the UKCS or, or, or further afield um, who actually just need a little bit of help and they need to see that business value delivered through digital technology and and you know so having a um, a, a, a whizbing technology that's that's accompanied by some sort of service provision as you know a service pack that can be adjusted to suit the the the, um, the customer specific needs is really important but again establishing those requirements up front is absolutely critical so you know you need to work, really understand what it is that people what would your customers want out of this application because there's only a few people that that have either the time or the money for technology for technology's sake that's a, it's a very good point you talk about a digitalization journey i hear that a lot i speak to a lot of people and they talk about digitalization journey but a journey for me has to have a start point and has to have an end and if you don't have a discrete end, I'm sure as anybody who's walked around London trying to follow a certain map app, you can end up all over the place. So with, with your stakeholders and, and I guess members of, of your organization, do you hear that a lot about digitalization journey, but can they crystallize what it actually is and what it means to them and where they're going? It's quite interesting you say that. I am um, a very prominent uh, French OFS company. Um, a good uh, friend of ours, a member of ours became um, very senior in their digitalization team. And the question I asked this gentleman was, what does that mean? And he said, well, it depends who you're asking. It's five different things to six different people on the same day. And um, so I think, I think it would be fair to say we're not quite sure as an industry what that means. I'm almost going to throw it back, though, because if you were developing an app in Silicon Valley, you'd be quite you'd be quite comfortable with that because a lot of that innovation comes from the serendipitous moments of trying to discover something which might not be quite defined as you know no one set out to uh, create uber i mean it just it was somebody with a phone and went hold on this gps could work quite well if we map that over because i can't hail a taxi downtown san francisco so i'm, I'm going to i'm going to throw that back at you and to say maybe as an industry we can become comfortable with that and um you know it's it's it, it, innovation can be defined by the journey itself not the end um I, I don't know if that just sounds like something out of a corporate textbook, but but I, 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 that's my sense. You know, no, no one, like I say, no one set out to create WhatsApp or one of these many prominent um, technology businesses that we use every day in our consumer lives. And I think maybe there's a lesson there. Um, not, not sure if that's an answer for you, but, but it, it's an interesting it's an interesting viewpoint because a journey is a journey, right? But if if oil and gas just ambles along, there is other vectors such as renewables and hydrogen who are clearly trying to set out a discrete journey and a path and a time frame, And they are clearly supported by governments globally. So potentially they're gonna get there quicker 
than what oil and gas does. Well, of course, that, that, that's the difference, right? Um, and so to take, to, to take that thought process one step further, we don't have that option anymore just to, as you quite rightly point out, to be OK with it, it might happen. So um, now I think the danger that we have is, let's take a, again, let's take a step back from oil and gas. Let's go into, I'll go back to my old sector, telcos. Um, the big telcos, despite Orange Labs, which I referenced earlier, don't have a great track record themselves of creating the apps and, 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 and the products. Sure. And, and so, you know, there, there's this challenge, which is we can't sit back and just let someone take over um, and, you know, eat our lunch, so to speak. But again, you know, we talk about a lot about transition. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a, again, one, last time I promised, but a telco term into it. I don't think we need to see it as transition. I think we need to see it as convergence. And the interesting bit about the telco sector, and I think there's a parallel to be drawn with the oil and gas and the energy sector, is when you look at businesses like Shell and BP with Light Source and Shell with what was First Utility, uh, New Motion and Charge Master and these businesses, prominent businesses they bought, you're actually starting to see a convergence of business models as much as the generation capacity on the traditional hydrocarbons. And I think that's really interesting. And I think that's where you know, businesses like Exora, who are you know, agnostic in this space about tech, can really play a role because ultimately we need people from the outside looking in. And again, I'll just use some examples. And we should take comfort in the fact that um, I don't think any of us are using a piece of BT tech that was created in-house in Ipswich in their labs either. So uh, a lot of it was bought in as well. So uh, maybe there's a lesson there. And again, probably Chris knows more about that than I do, but just from an outside in. Yeah, I think, you make it, again, it's a valid point about learning from other sectors as well. So I guess, Clara, I'll come to yourself. Is there any particular sectors or any organisations that you work with to, to learn how to really draw on that technology adoption uh, deployment experience? I think um, our first port of call it is, is our peers. And um, you know, talking to our, our IT manager earlier, he said it, it's come on a long way. People used to be very secretive and you know, keep their, their IP to themselves. Um, and there's a lot more sharing going on now and so there's i think there are monthly um it manager sessions where all, all the operators get together and do actually share case studies and, and learn from each other and then out, outside that um that there, there is the supply chain but he does say um we you get bombarded and i you know i put a linkedin thing on earlier saying what's coming on this and then you know everyone's trying to sell you something and it you do i think you, you do try and protect yourself because you can't pay for all these things. You know, they all sound like good ideas and everyone will convince you it's the best thing to slice bread and it's what you need. But you need a, a technology forum where you can go to and just, just see things and compare them and, and see how they apply to you and not get the sort of the hard sell. And the oil and gas technology centre is very good and oil and gas UK are very good at sort of showcasing technology out there. As for sort of going further afield, um, I don't think we're as good. You know, the oil and gas industry isn't as good. We wait for it to come to us. Um, but there are the large engineering firms now, and they are not just focusing on oil and gas. So we're sort of, you know, getting the benefit from them. But they, again, we're not seeing huge innovations. They seem to be quite slow in, in adopting things. So maybe it is companies like Chris's um, that are, I'll ask Chris, what, where do you get your your uh, information from? What other sectors do you look at? Well, I mean, that, that's really interesting, actually, because, you know, we, 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 um, we've been connected to the sort of the nuclear industry, been connected to the aviation industry, uh, not formally, but sort of informally. And I guess, you know, our, our because we are a technology business, you know, a, a large part of our organization, the, the, the technologists, I'll call them, at least the sort of the data science technologists um, ha have an agnostic background, right? So. Um, so they're actually able to, uh, we're able to, to, to bring those in from other industries. Um, and it actually, because we're pairing them up with those industry experts, you know, that, that model kind of works. Um, and, and I think that, um, you know, it, we, we're not really, I think, focusing specifically on any other industry. I do think there's plenty of opportunities, you know, within things like the automotive and, 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 and even nuclear, which you'd, you'd think would be a sort of fairly, um, slow and steady uh, industry is, is is having to adopt some new technologies and i think it's not just the technologies as well it's also the ways of working and i think that's the other thing about the uh, that we could learn from the other um, industries whether it's telcos whether it's you know the automotive and it, it is about how to um 
to to better streamline our you know relationships whether those are you know the the um, operator supply chain relationships whether it's the the supply chain itself you know consolidating where we can and, and coming together to offer operators um you know a, a joined up um, approach to solving some of their problems. That would be, you know, if, if, if every single supplier got together with one other supplier, that would be 50% less phone calls for Clara, for example. At the very least, that sounds like a bit of a win. So, um, you know, there are different approaches that we can take, I think, and, and learning from other industries, I, I feel is not just about, you know, um, lifting and shifting the technology, although that's absolutely critical, but it's also about the way that they've deployed the technology. And I think there's some really good lessons um, uh, uh, to learn there as well. Yeah, so I'm going to come to yourself in a minute on that one, Ian, as well. So very fortunate in the role that I do, I get to see other sectors and I get to see other industries, how they do it. And you picked up on the, on the automotive industry. And the automotive industry has had to evolve and become uber efficient because of globalisation predominantly. Particularly if you look at the UK, making a car in the UK is technically more expensive than making a car in Eastern Europe, for example. So they had to become really efficient, adopt technology, that was the first phase. The second phase is by 2030, 35, 2040, depending which country you're in, the combustion engine's been phased out. So now they're heavily involved in R&D to get a car with batteries or even hydrogen fuel cells that can perform at the level that we expect from, from petrol and diesel. The point I'd like to make though is they have an interwoven web of partnerships, collaborations, and they're not so much interested in what industry are you from? It's what do you bring to the party? What can you do? This is, this is our digitalization transformation that we need to do on this vehicle. What can you do in this space to help me to get to point X from point Y? And I still don't see that within the oil and gas industry. And it's really interesting, Clara, I picked up on your first point. You said the first protocol is peer-to-peer. In the automobile industry, their first protocol is the complete opposite to that they go outside of their peer group to understand what they can bring in. Do you see that happening eventually with it, within oil and gas, Clara? Do you, do you see the point where you go, go to speak to somebody like uh, Jaguar Land Rover down in Solihull to see what they're doing with their cars and what technology you can bring into oil and gas? Me personally, probably not, <laughs> just because the size of the company. So. You know, it sounds like I'm making an excuse, but Sarah, because you know we're, we're 150 people, we're not a major. We haven't got a huge R&D department um, going out looking to start um, technology from scratch. We are really learning from our peers, and you know we're not stuck in a vacuum. The oil and gas industry is not stuck in a vacuum. We are looking at you know handheld devices um, for offshore. We're looking at you know wireless devices. Um, what do you call it? The goggles, et cetera, the, you know, the technology is coming to the industry. We are a marketplace for that. Um, Serica itself wouldn't go out to, to the automotive industry to develop something to be used offshore, but we would pick up from oil and gas technology center, which has you know, got lots of different um, projects going on um, and we team up and we'd support it that way. But I do think going peer to peer we're getting the advantage of the majors um, development budgets so that we, you know, we can learn from them. So yeah, not personally, but we're not in a vacuum. There are new technologies out there that we are bringing in. It's um, interesting that point. other industries are using, but we're, we're not going to develop them from scratch. It's interesting point peer to peer and talking about super majors. So I was talking to the super major just last Wednesday and what he said to me was, he said he's expecting the supply chain to invent innovations and bring innovations to him. So you end up in this, then yeah, yeah. you end up in this lag of situation, right? So what do you think, Ian, from a global perspective? Do you see collaboration? Do you see partnerships? Do you see companies such as Exora are supplanting R and D teams within within the oil and gas sector? Yeah, so it's really interesting. So I'll just take a little bit away from um, the UKCS just because. Um, well, one, it's the question, but two, you know, we, we see partnerships a lot in Europe, in the UK, and we, we see that between private sector, peer-to-peer, -peer. but where, where we're seeing a lot of innovation, and it comes back to the net zero goal, I think, as well, um, and back to a point that Clara mentioned around attracting graduates as, um, into the sector, is at that tertiary education level. So you've got real success stories from the oil and gas industry 
going into country in places where you know the oil and gas industry is still the job that, that those graduates want um, you go you go to Nigeria you go to um, Mozambique you go to Ghana the success there um, which you know UK operators have had in going into the u university system in that in in that country and they are going in there and they're creating what you know we would call field ready, ready graduates and it's something we should be proud of I don't think we talk about it enough um, you know, I mentioned at the beginning of this, talking about the S and the G in the ESG. Um, and I think that those are the partnerships that are really interesting. You know, we've only got in South Africa, uh, Block 11B, potentially one of the biggest gas fines in the world over the last two decades. And um, more to come on that if you talk to the people on the ground. Well, this is a country that has a massive net import of hydrocarbons. And, you know, quite famously is on load shedding and uses a massive amount of coal, one of the biggest in the world. Um, there's a huge opportunity there for those, those, those parts of the world and, and those countries and, and, and so forth to um, really develop partnerships. And, and we know that's already happening with the likes of Total down in South Africa who, who are operating on 11B. And, you know, and we've got, like I said, there's examples of that in Mozambique using uh, univer universities up there in uh, Mobutu as well as in places like Ghana. So I just think we've got to define what partnership is. And I think there are some, you know, the, the, the kickback there is it's not really a financial one directly and, and for the industry. It's developing well-educated, field-ready engineers. Um, and we, again, I don't think we talk about that enough as an industry. And I, I reference Africa, but that's a story repeated in South America, in Southeast Asia. Um, and, you know, we shouldn't be ashamed to be coming forward on that, I don't think. I, I think we sometimes are. Um, but I would suggest those people that, that are should get on a plane to Lagos and ask what the industry has done on the ground. It's not, it's not always what makes it into certain newspapers. Oh, I think it's a very valid point. In my, in my travels, I've seen that a lot. You probably hear I've got a, a lot of questions coming in, but before I start going to the questions for, for the panel, one last place I want to go is around projects and project delivery. So I'm sure we're all aware that the time from discovering, from seismic discovery to probably first oil, first gas, typically takes around 15 years, depending on the size, size of the asset that, that needs to go into place. For that time frame and the billions of pounds that have to be expended before you, before you recover basically your, your MPV, the equivalent in renewables or hydrogen, not so much hydrogen these days, but that'll get there, but particularly renewables is a lot shorter. And I guess from your perspective, Ian, you must see this from a finance, from finance house, from hedge funds and VCs, etc., that they're starting to see that to be more attractive. And, and I guess what backed that up was I was at a conference last week and uh, again, a super major, a VP of a super major, he made a statement that the super projects such as the preludes and the pearls of the past are gone, they're dead because nobody will finance that anymore because of the threat of the, I guess, investors being able to get their returns through renewables. Do you see that playing out in the finance world? Yeah, it, so there's a big question. So, I mean, let, let's start with another headline number. The, the amount of money committed to renewables is extreme. Um, and, you know, you compare that to only 10 years ago, we we're in multiples two, three times. However, none of that is enough to to get to our 2030 goals that have been labelled by the IOCs. I'm, I'm specifically talking about super majors here, let alone 2050 and what we're talking about today. So it's just a headline, despite the amount of capital coming in from the private sector, it's not enough. So the second part of that is, you know, is I guess the social licence to operate. And, and, you know, the reality is, is that many of our public funded companies, the, 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 um, the public markets are largely closed to them, certainly, certainly in Europe. Um, I think there's a question mark which we don't have a, maybe enough time today to talk about, which is when a European or North American super major pulls out of a particular market, let's say West Africa, um, and that's replaced by either a local NOC or a, 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 a mid-cap company that maybe isn't able as much to develop their own R&D and so forth. What does that mean for net zero? I, I think that's a question and a, a topic within itself. But just on the capital, I just... The one thing I'd say on the returns is this myth in the oil and gas industry, and, uh, and, it's, and again, it's, it's been out there for years, the returns aren't there in renewables, the returns aren't there. And that was largely true. Um, but renewables are inherently deflationary. You've talked about the costs and how they've come down, and depending on whether it's onshore, offshore, solar, um, and, and the type of solar, the inflationary costs are creating the returns because ultimately, ultimately, the amount of capex, capex that's going into those projects is just so much less than it was um, previously. 
Um, I'm still going to come back as a final point, though, is if you are, let's take India, again, massive coal generation um, capacity, what, what is, to get to net zero, what is best for the world? Is it for them to, is it for them to import LNG from the US and do that quickly, or the LNG from Western Australia? Um, or is it for them to buy lots of Chinese PV? Now, if you want to put geopolitical scope on it, it's not going to be the Chinese no. PV. So, you know, what, we've just got to have those honest debates. And I don't know if we, we, we're, we are comfortable within our own skin as an industry to do that enough, but I think those are the debates that need to be, be, be have it happening on a more regular basis. Oh, it's, a, it's an interesting viewpoint. So we're really pushed for time. So there's a few questions that, that I want to go to if I can. And I'm going to go to Clara with this one as well, because it, it touches on, on what was mentioned earlier. And from a Sarica perspective, and I guess Greater North Sea, do you see oil and, co oil and gas companies developing tech in-house or do you see them going predominantly external over the next five-year horizon? It depends on the tech. So I know um, things like digitalization, um, and I've had discussions with other companies as well, sort of going outside or doing it in-house. And so building your own um, expertise in-house on cleaning up your data accessing your data and displaying it for information purposes. I think companies want to do that in-house more with a bit of support from external, but getting that that knowledge and that skill internally, not just handing it over and, and paying for an external software. So I think building your, your digital expertise will be done more in-house. Um, tech, I think, will sort of will be done by the supply chain. If you're looking at um, sort of remotely operated uh, vehicles or yeah, like uh, vessels without uh, crews, you know, sort of guard vessels that are driven by um, solar power or, you know, the, the, the tech that that um, lowers your, your emissions and it's, it's building new pieces of equipment. I think a supply chain, that will come from other companies, supply chains. You might get the majors buying them, which we've sort of seen already. But I think the time when the, the oil and gas companies have their own laboratories, universities, building these things, I don't think we're, we're going back to that, although they might start buying things up, a bit like yourselves, <laughs> so that you've got that advantage. Yeah. So it, yeah, it'll be different arms maybe of the oil and gas companies, but the core core oil and gas companies, I think they'll keep their, their digital tech and expertise maybe in-house with a bit of support. But for anything more revolutionary and, and that they'll go externally or they'll buy startup companies. Okay, that's interesting. Chris, from your perspective, do you see the day where you have your, your teams supplanted inside oil and gas companies, working with them full time within their offices? Well, actually, I mean, it's interesting because I, I mean, I actually agree with Clara. I think that, you know, there's a lot of digital tech that's readily available and readily accessible now. And I mean, it's a bit like, you know, back in the very olden days, you know, if you wanted a computer, you just you could only afford one computer. You had to go to a, you know, to work with somebody in partnership and put one computer in your office and do all the calculations on it. Nowadays, it's, it's democratized and you just buy PCs online and they show up at your office and you install them for each individual user. Now, some digital technology is in that space already. You talk about Power BI, it's very accessible. Um, but actually, you know, the, 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 the breadth and the depth of, of data science and the application of artificial intelligence extends, you know, well into some really exciting and, and, and to be quite frank, inaccessible technology that could still provide value to, to the oil and gas industry and will still provide value to the oil and gas industry. So for me, it's just about where um, our customers specifically, but, but companies feel that they, they, they want to be on that line, you know, and there are some customers who invest still very, very heavily in, in, you know, their own drilling operations, for example, which you could, you could say has already completely entered the, uh, the supply chain. And there are others who rely almost entirely on outsourcing, you know, the, the majority of that. And that's a sort of fairly well established part of the, of the supply chain. I think, you know, the digitalization is, is very much the same. You know, I think, there are some people who want to do it themselves um, and, and do bits of it themselves, but there will always be that inaccessible advanced tech that they'll need to rely on the supply chain to provide because it just becomes cost prohibitive and, and you can't, you know, gone are the days of the of the labs that, that can hire, you know, these super geniuses from, from universities in data science just to sort of potter about with, you know, hoping that they'll come up with some exciting new tech because it's just not affordable and, 
and they've got to watch their costs just like anyone else. And the supply chain can do that much more efficiently. Yeah, it's a very valuable point. So last question, uh, it's to all three of you, and I'll start with Ian first. Give me three technologies that you feel will have the biggest impact on the oil and gas, I guess, net zero drive, and also the ability to compete with other energy sources in the future. Hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. Interesting. Chris? Uh, they, uh, artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence. <laughs> No, I just do think it, it, it can be very quickly deployed. And I think that's that's something that we're, we're quite passionate about is getting it, um, you know, getting it deployed now. And I think some of this big tech is absolutely critical. But, you know, getting people, you know, using Power BI um, and, and using this kind of technology now is 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 going to be, you know, really deliver that 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 behavior, cultural and ultimately business transformation that we're looking for. Yeah, I think now is the, is the right word there, actually. And last, Clara. Yeah, if it's three, I'd say yeah, digitalization, um, hydrogen stroke CCS, but also um, emissions management. So reducing your the energy intensity of your operations and decarbonizing that. So it's it's new fuels, motors, electrification. So being able to design a net zero, and your supply your um, supply vessels, etc., getting them to zero. So it's fuel, alternative fuels. Okay, thank you. I guess it's like any complex activity within society, there's no silver bullet. And there's definitely no silver bullet at all. I hear cost plays a big part, development, in-house, out-house R&D departments. I think it's a real mishmash of where the industry needs to go. For me personally, what else comes out from the conversation is digitalization is a journey, but we need to establish what the end point is to be able to compete and I'm absolutely hearing the more I talk to people about this, there's an intertwining of driving down the cost of the oil and gas industry to compete, but using that also at the same time to give us the, I guess, the emissions aspects and reducing and on the drive towards net zero as well. So many thanks to the panelists. It's been a really interesting debate. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. And thank you for watching. Thank you. Thank you.